an anecdote uh, for Edward on the question of uh, uh, separation of the Auditor General and, 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 and the control of the budget. And some of you may and others may not know that I actually sort of advised the COE on that chapter of the Constitution. I actually did write the first draft of the uh, chapter 12 on public finance. And uh, this idea, uh, we were putting together a lot of material from, from, from the past. And this idea of separating two offices had been floating around for a while. It was in Bomas. I believe it actually came from East Park. Because the first person I remember pushing it very hard many years ago was Juraine, who's been in, at KRA. Uh, so after the Constitution, after I, said, I thought, you know, I have sort of quite a bit of the background, how, how I actually decided that it should go, it should go in. Um, so uh, after the Constitution and the Jubilee government was in office, I get a call from one of our old colleagues who was then a powerful minister called Anwai Goro. Some of you will know that she was our research assistant with John when we were doing the bribery index in TI. She was actually my first research assistant at the time. And she asks me, where did you people get this crazy idea of separating uh, the Auditor General and, uh, and, 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 and the controller? And how is it supposed to work? And she was really being, and of course, I mean, I sort of have my ways of, 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 of uh, getting people to calm down, uh, especially, uh, and wouldn't be too difficult for me to handle. Uh, so she calmed down, and I explained sort of a bit of the background. Um, and they said they had, because they'd been looking all over and couldn't find an institution that, uh, in a country which had a similar system, so they were really struggling with how it's supposed to work. I said, look, if you go back into history, you will actually find that's the way uh, these uh, functions used to be, like in the UK, in uh, I think up to the late 19th century or early 20th century. But more importantly, fortunately, I had actually done a fellowship in the, and gone studying the public account, finance accountability system, PFM, in the, in the US. And although it wasn't, uh, whatever, there's quite a number of states which actually have sort of separate control. And I gave a list of them, California, a couple of cities, I think Boston and New York and a couple of other places. Um, but basically, it was not the first instance, I think, since the Constitution that I have received, and that's not the only conversation I had. There was a very nasty conversation with Kenua on something else uh, about that chapter of the Constitution. So that chapter of the Constitution is extremely unpopular in Treasury, uh, precisely for the reasons that you have mentioned uh, about democratizing the, the sort of public financial management. Because people don't realize that when we talk about the imperial presidency, which we like to talk about when uh, we were uh, sort of doing the constitution, we always focused on the presidency and forget that really the uh, power of the past of the imperial presidency, uh, that treasury was a very critical uh, institution. And I quite uh, support that we need to revisit uh, and uh, that, that institution and ask whether there are some functions, more functions that we need to do something about, which of course will be extremely unpopular with, uh, with, with those people, but I think uh, they cannot. So I think, yeah, uh, just point lighting that there is still a battle uh, in terms of public financial management uh, that needs to happen. But today, uh, I'm going to sort of my comments, uh, uh, we'll, I would want to start by obviously congratulating Washira. I know how much he struggled to put this together, when, uh, uh, particularly uh, dealing with uh, trying to sort of push the frontier of how we analyze and look at uh, corruption. Engineering this sort of, sort of reframing of, of, of issues is, is actually quite difficult. Uh, because in anything, but Corruption in particular has proved extremely, not just difficult to combat, but it's also proved to be very difficult to discipline intellectually. I mean, uh, the, it keeps sort of, it's a shape-shifting animal. So you find that uh, even as intellectuals try to frame it in a way that we are able to then engage it in a manner and ask what kind of uh, evidence we should bring and what kind of analysis and evidence to, 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 make, to design policy and institutional interventions, uh, the thing keeps shifting. So we, we're struggling with, we have struggled with, with intellectual sort of framework, a uh, robust intellectual framework for a very long time. So I know the struggle that Washira has, is going through trying to sort of just get a grip 
of of of, of this beast and i think i'm really sort of it's a very it's a very commendable i think uh, effort sometimes we fear of, of doing this sort of thing because you don't want to be <coughs> sort of challenged you can fall flat on your face uh, but I think it's very courageous for him to, to, to do this. Uh, and those of you who read my column in the East African Review may have acro came across actually two columns I have written lately which have the same title. Uh, in fact, the title is uh, Chronic Capitalism and State Capture. So obviously I've also been grappling with, with this subject. So uh, what I will do, I want to do is to contextualize. So you can see how the sort of, uh, how what Washira is doing and the sort of issues I've been grappling with uh, fit together. The, the subtitle, the first of, of that first column was uh, Chronic Capitalism and State Capture, the Kenyatta Family Story. And the second one is Chronic Capitalism and State Capture 2, and it says documents reveal Kenyatta Family plans to take over lending to SMEs. Now, <coughs> I think some of these are self sort of explanatory. Uh, but how does it relate to, to Ashira's work? and uh, to this uh, state capture. If you look at Washira's work, I can sort of simplify, not, not simplify this story, <coughs> is that he's looking and he's focused on the capture of first the public finance system for purposes of stealing, you know, you sort of shake down the public financial accountability system, the thing that Edward is supposed to be sort of overseeing and reporting <coughs> to for us. Edward is our watchman as a public. Uh, through uh, reporting to parliament. So that, the capture of that institution so that the money, public monies can be stolen. And then the capture of the criminal justice system so that people can get away with it. So once you capture the public fi finance system, you capture the cow so that you, you're milking it, and then you make sure that you <laughs> capture the cops uh, so that you can continue milking the cow and nothing happens to you. But the essence of it is that uh, it is to enable people to, to basically steal public money. Procurement rackets, all manner of rackets, steal public money. <laughs> the economic side, which I sort of have been grappling with myself, uh, uh, not that, I mean, we've done a lot of work, as jo mentioned, on, on, on bribery and other things, and bribery index. But even if you look at that, the, the, the bribery side, um, and particularly the economic, uh, the economic dimension you're looking at now, this sort of uh, chronic capitalism side, what you're looking at is not uh, stealing money from the budget, but it is stealing money from the people. So that side steals our tax money, and this economic side picks our pockets. Yeah? When we buy goods and services. <laughs> Yeah? When you pay, when you're forced to pay a bribe, that's not public money, it's, it's private money. So he's looking at the pu public money side, and I'm looking at the, at the private money side. But it's the same people. That's the point. In fact, if you are to then uh, characterize the current regime between the president and his deputy, what they seem to have decided is to sort of uh, divide the pie. So Mr. Ruto does the public, and Mr. Kenyatta does the private. That, that's the way this sort of pie uh, seems to be divided. So you can look at it as Washira has basically talked more about the Ruto side, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Kenyatta side. Uh, and the way I look at uh, sort of language of it, what you see uh, from the Kenyatta side is that it's uh, what you might call enclosure of, of large swaths of the economy by the Kenyatta sort of family and, and their business cronies. Uh, the word enclosure, for those of you who know, who know some European history, it obviously comes from uh, the land enclosures of the 17th and 18th century, which transformed uh, the agrarian peasantry into an urban proletariat, uh, which has then become a sort of industrial labor force, and all sorts of manner of history. And of course, that movement reached here with the colonial land grab, because the same sort of aristocrats who 
who grabbed land in Europe, in, in UK, for instance, are the same fellows who benefited uh, from uh, the land grab, the Dalamayas and, and, and the likes. Uh, so we are also victims of, 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 of that uh, sort of uh, uh, enclosure uh, movement as, as relates to land. And of course, then the African elite took over. Yeah, the politi African political, sort of African bourgeois, with the, led by Kenyatta. Uh, and that enclosure of land we know is still going on. So it, it actually hasn't stopped. But if we fast forward and now begin to talk about uh, where, where are we at? What is the state of play of, of that particular uh, industry? Uh, in that first uh, article I wrote on uh, the Kajata family story, one of the industries I highlighted was the monopolization of milk processing, the attempt to monopolize milk processing by the Kenyatta family and the Brookside dairies. dairies. Uh, during his first term, the, pro the consumer price of milk increased from 36 shillings to 60 shillings a half liter packet. Uh, the farm gate price did not increase. In fact, uh, it was, as Kenyatta family was uh, acquiring more market power and intimidating people using the provincial administration uh, to sell milk to them and uh, sort of harassing other competitors, uh, the farm gate price actually uh, kept or kept or kept down, so that uh, by the end of the term, by own, my own estimates, which is not very difficult to do for that industry, there is quite a bit of public information. Uh, during his first term, the turnover of uh, Brookside dairies will have increased from something like 13, double actually, almost from about 13 billion to 22 billion shillings, and the gross margin that is the just difference between prices before you take out sort of uh, your overheads from about 7 billion to about 15 billion shillings. So where somebody was out eating dams, uh, so there are some other people who are picking our pockets. And this is year in, year out. They probably are making as much money every year uh, from our pockets. Now, you, you may recall those of you who follow the economy that uh, this is as a result of the Kenyatta family actually acquiring virtually all the competitors, the big uh, data processing competitors. And this happened, had happened in the previous couple of years when Kenyatta was finance minister. And as finance minister, he had oversight over the competition authority. So as they were taking over and buying all these companies, there was no chance that the competition authority was going to raise an objection. Because the fi finance minister's company business was the one which was taking over, was doing these acquisitions. Now, in any sort of uh, other country, including uh, other than perhaps the United States uh, at present, and not in the past, uh, under the present leadership. I mean, this sort of thing, in a democratic country, this sort of thing would, I mean, it would be completely uh, beyond the pale. But, but this is not something that I think is strongly on our radar for some historical reasons. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, not too long ago, and then subsequently, you have new data regulations, which, which, which uh, raised hue and cry. Now, these data regulations were proposing to outlaw uh, trade in raw milk. Now, what's the purpose of that? Uh, it, even though the Huru uh, the Kajata family controls uh, uh, processing, processing only takes in 20% of, of the milk produced in Kenya. 80% is actually drunk at home and, and sold uh, informally. So it's largely an informal sector economy. One inch economy, you know, people trading milk, selling to their neighbors, all manner of things. Uh, but with this law, uh, that would have tried to push all the milk uh, to, the, to the processors, which is a control controlled by the Kenyatta family. And by my calculation, if they only managed to get that up to 50% from the current 20 using that law, that would increase, without factoring in price and other things, based on current parameters, it would increase the turnover of Brookside dairies to 100 billion a year. Yeah. It increased to 100 billion shillings a year. And on 100 billion shillings, if you have that kind of market power, you're probably making 25 to 30 billion in profits every year.
So it looks like a small thing. Uh, you are preoccupied with who's stealing uh, NYS money, little here and there, Kabura. <laughs> uh, but the big shakedown is that every day you are going to buy milk, every morning you're buying milk and putting something like 10 shillings in Kenyatta's pocket for every packet. Yeah, the president. What about the French? <laughs> they, they, I think they've quit. Uh, there is a problem with the French. That, uh, he's talking about Danone. It's a company, it's a French company which had actually bought shares. Uh, and I think, I don't know, I'm not sure, but uh, I suspect it has something to do with political exposure. As a, as a big European brand, uh, some of these things, if they get to excess, they, I think you can, they, they, they can cause problems. Um, now, but the main thing of that sort of second article uh, I talked about was a credit scheme, which was then branded with Zesha. And I was able to write this because of documents that a whistleblower in that banking system had, uh, uh, had sent to me. A whistleblower, one of the senior executives who was involved in this scheme, uh, put together the documents of that uh, plan and uh, said, Look, give these documents to David D. He, he might actually know what to do with them. So they are conscientious people, even in, in, in that system. So I went through those documents, uh, and as I went through them, I mean, it was one of those light bulb moment things. Because I look at the document, and the first thing I see is CBA, Commercial Bank of Africa. Second thing in the document, this is a PowerPoint presentation of a private sort of uh, business scheme. Second thing, which is all over the documents, is Huduma number. And then on the last page, there is what is to me, of course, uh, it's not apparent, it would not be readily apparent to, to many other people, is a fraudulent public credit guarantee scheme. So you say there is a scheme here by CBA Bank to put in place a fraudulent uh, credit guarantee scheme for a product which is aligned with and in fact leveraged on Huduma number. I said, wow. Okay. So I write about it. The column appeared a day or two before the State of the Nation address. Uh, and then, lo and behold, during the State of the Nation address, the President announces something which sounds almost similar. In fact, very similar. And I ask myself, can the president announce a business scheme, a family business scheme, during the State of the Nation address? Because it's not public policy. I had not seen it anywhere else. I would know because that's a sector I work in. Uh, and I ask myself, can he actually do that? So after the State of Nation address, I call up a couple of contacts in the business banking sector and CBK, and they tell me they actually do not know. They are not party to something, anything like that. So we leave it at that for the moment. So fast forward, the scheme was launched two days ago. They've changed the name. It's now called Stawi, but it's the same thing. In fact, the governor of the central bank was commandeered and taken to do a product activation, just as is in those documents, in exactly the same place, only two weeks behind schedule uh, of what is written in those documents. By the way, those documents are available on the Elephant Archive. You can actually download, uh, you can see it in the Elephant Archive. We put it up there uh, a while back. Now, not only does the CBK governor uh, go out to activate a product for the president's bank, he actually missells the product. Misselling is a financial crime. When you are giving the public uh, characteristics of a product that are not true. So the issue assessment, where they are saying this is a transformational thing, which is going to provide cheap credit to small enterprises at 9%, which is below the market rate. The CBK has been at the forefront of getting banks to disclose the true cost of credit. And there's a standard uh, parameter used to disclose the true cost of credit called APR, annual percentage rate. The CBK does not talk about the annual percentage rate, 
of Stawi. They say, no, this is going to lend microenterprises money at 9%, which is why the central bank is providing a credit guarantee. It is a lie. The, a the APR of that product, when you include fees and all the other things which are actually disclosed, ranges from 14.5, oops, no, ranges from 14.5% for a one year loan to 75% if you borrow for one month. And because most of these small traders uh, will borrow for one month or two or three months, it means that the actual earnings, because what you're doing is as a bank, you're charging a fee, a commission, There's a fixed amount, maybe two or three or five percent. And this person borrows 10,000 shillings for a month and then gives it back to you. Then you charge the money, you lend it to another person and you charge them a 4% commission, like that, like that, like that. So the more churn you have, the more you earn, okay? So if you ask uh, yourself how much uh, money is the banks going to make if they churn 10,000 shillings 12 times, you know, every month, and they're going to make 75%. So for 10,000 shillings, if they churn it 12 times, they're going to make 7,500 shillings on that 10,000. If they churn it four times, they're going to make 3,000 shillings. Yeah? If, they, if it's only once, it's 14.5%, which is still high. That means that this scheme is highly profitable. The 9% the is irrelevant. It means all the risks of lending to small enterprises are covered in the fees. So why is it getting a public credit guarantee? If, it is already, if the risk is already priced, and in fact overpriced, it is no different from Tala or Branch or Emshuari or Fuliza. It's exactly the same. It should be able to go out there and compete. But it gets central bank backing. It is launched by the governor. And what you see is it is leveraged on Huduma number. In fact, in the documentation, Huduma centers are listed as one of the places, one of the part of the distribution system. So they're taking their business into government. You are going to be buying CBA products at Huduma Centers. It is in the documentation. I am not making this up. Yeah? Now, what does this tell us? This scheme was not devised overnight. Yeah? It was launched in April. If you look at the document, uh, it was planned to be, you can see that it was planned to, to launch in April. And then, before that, what do we get? We get a rushed and whatever of push of Huduma number. So why is so much government energy being put in Huduma number? We have not seen anything like this on any other thing. What is the impetus? What's driving a hud Huduma number? There's a personal side to this story, and I will go back to it, and hopefully I can actually tell it without getting too emotional about it. In 2014, I get a call, and I'm approached by Fred Matiangi. Many of you will know that Fred Matiangi has been our colleague for a long time. He actually worked on uh, the, the uh, Sunni parliamentary strengthening program, which actually goes back to work for Shira and I I started in the early 90s with the Institute of Economic Affairs. I was the first CEO of the Institute of Economic Affairs when it was founded in 93. I recruited Washira. Uh, he took over from me after a short time. And then Washira went off to set off CGD. And between CGD and IEA, we sort of build up this uh, sort of parliamentary sort of strengthening work, uh, which was then scaled up by USA, the Dasuni. And the Matiangi story comes much later. So Matiangi calls me, and he wants to ask me whether uh, my wife would consider uh, helping them out on a problem. And the problem is, 
Uh, they want to do this new third or fourth generation ID, and they are having a problem because the bureaucrats are giving them a run around, and they actually think that there's a racket going on, and they would like a, an outsider, an expert, uh, to, to help them out. And at this time, uh, my dear wife is working for the African Development Bank in, in, in Tunis. That's how I end up uh, being in Tunis in the course of all this uh, revolution in Moreno. And, uh, and, and uh, she's obviously a sort of an, uh, an expert in, in, in managing and sort of large IT projects. So I call her up and ask her whether it's something she would consider. She consults internally, and uh, for, she was working the, for the press. Oh, he was there too, so <laughs> <they> <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> yeah. of course, yeah. <laughs> I remember, yeah. So, uh, so, so he, she consults internally, and uh, it's something that, you know, the bank would consider, no problem. Uh, it's supposed to be a short-term thing. She uh, sort of chair task force for about three months. Uh, it ends up, uh, the, the, the president actually writes to Kaberuka, requesting him to give her leave of absence to come and do this. Uh, Kaberuka gives her years leave of absence to cut a long story. Instead of being a three-month thing, she gets appointed to be the director general in charge of all those immigration and, and all the matter of registries and things so that they can do this huge project. Now, I do recall when she looks at it, and the idea was to do a th clean up the data. There were lots of corrupted data. She looks at it. She comes home. She's looking at the thing. And I look at it and she said, you know, I don't think that we should, uh, it makes sense to clean up this, this data. If the data is corrupted, garbage in, garbage out. I think the best thing would be to junk this, 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 this old ID, this data, and we shift from a biographic to biometric ID. I listen. It makes sense. She has to go and present to the president. And I'm actually the one who gives her the language of how, because she can speak about it technically, but I am more conversant with speaking to politicians. So I say, now, if you want to explain it to the president, this is how I think you should explain it. You see, when you meet a policeman, they will ask you, who are you? And you give them your ID. And the policeman will look at your ID and will tell you, oh, where well, in D. He looks at the photo, looks at the image, tries to see that you are the same person, even though the photo is old, uh, you know, it's taken when you are a young person, but gives you the benefit of the doubt and says you are divinity. Higher, Hender, or whatever. Now, say, now that ID can be forged, all manner of things, and remember, this is against the backdrop of Westgate. When we had criminals, terrorists use our... Our, our, our identity, documentation, passports, and all sorts of things, white widow. Uh, so that's the context in which this is happening. So, so now, what you're going to tell him is, when you do this biometric ID, when you meet the policeman, the police or policeman, they will not ask you, well, Nani, give me your ID. They will have a gadget, probably your phone, their phone, and will tell you, put your thumbprint print here. You have to it up. Yeah? Like we do at the airport, the sort of the migration. Then you put the, the print, and they will tell you, ah, where well, in D. SAS and D, you have three outstanding traffic fines that you have not paid. And the Kupata, Twende. Yeah? And she went and told it to him exactly like that. And he understood. So he got behind it and said, we must do this. And the logic of this was, our borders are too porous. We cannot physically police our borders. But if a fugitive or a terrorist or somebody who, an undesirable person, comes into the country through our porous borders, they should not be able to transact for too long yeah, without being caught. So the purpose of this thing that in her conversation with Uhuru, they decided we'll be called the single source of truth, uh, is that as soon as a, a, an undesirable person either tries to get a phone or checks into a hotel or, you know, sooner or later, a red flag will pop up because you will have a database, maybe from the FBI or other people, which has these people's biometrics. 
And those databases at some point, will, these people will pop up that this person is not who they claim they are. But all we need to do with that is actually quite simple. What we need to do was our ID, take your ID, you take your ID, you show up, say, I'm so and so, this is my ID, this is my birth certificate, blah, blah, blah. Take your biometrics and put the two together. So that the biometrics and your ID are in the same. That's it. Very simple. So, but of course, there's a lot of work behind it. And the work gets done, and within a couple of months, actually, the project is ready uh, to roll. Then stuff starts happening. Bureaucratic stonewalling, her calls not being picked up or returned as you're trying to deal with obstacles. Threats begin to happen. And at some point, actually, uh, she gets a fairly strong warning that uh, something bad might happen to her. Uh, and I said, look, it's not worth it. Uh, just walk away. There's a problem. And she does that. Clearly, what becomes very clear, the thing, and the thing which has bothered her up to this day is why the president checked out on her. That's a question she's always said she'd like to ask him. Why did you do this to me? And we've struggled with that question for many years and had all sorts of theories. It was elections, all manner of things. The penny for me did not drop until this Huduma number and the credit scheme. Because what it now looks like is that the national ID project would have been very difficult to commercialize. Yeah, because our ID has a particular sort of meaning and culture and, and legal framework around it. Yet it would have been easier to do. Because if we, are, we have all upgraded our IDs at some point, those of us who are older have done it three times. So if we had been told, come and upgrade your ID, I don't think anybody would have been asking, why? What is it for? Yeah? You know, it's time to upgrade the ID to the next generation. So no PR would have been required. And no time frame would have been required. And no deadline. So hey, so, but you've been told, our old IDs will stop being valid after this date. So make sure that you have upgraded your ID up to that point. But then, you could, there are so many things you could, that you are seeing that with the Huduma number that you could not do with our, or we would not allow you to do with our ID. For instance, the Nigerian ID is branded by MasterCard. Because they didn't have an ID before. So when the ID project came, it came with these Trojan horses, these commercial Trojan horses behind it. So the Nigerians have an ID with a MasterCard logo. I don't think you can put a MasterCard logo on the Kenyan ID and get away with it. It's an institution. Yeah? So what do you do? You've seen the solution. You've seen the commercial possibilities. But it's going to go into a public data uh, project called ID. So what do you do? You kill the public project and invent a new project which can be commercialized. Yeah? So if you look at the data being collected, uh, some of the data being collected on the Huduma number form, I looked at it and I said, this is exactly the data you need to do something in finance we call credit scoring. You don't need that data for identification. But it would be very useful, assets and things, it's not necessary for ID, but it's useful for credit scoring. So I started, as I conclude, talking about enclosure of land. And it's still going on. But you know, as times have changed, the sources of wealth have changed. We moved from land to capital. And now we know that we are in the information age and big data. 
and stuff like that. So the question is, are we looking at enclosure of our data? Is that what you're looking at? That is the question. So thanks for listening to me. Let me stop there.